Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to ask all of our panelists to uh, join me with video and audio, or at least video. Um, and welcome to our audience out there. And thank you really to both our audience and all of our speakers uh, for making some time to be with us today for this um, necessary conversation about free speech and Black Lives on campus. Um, I'm Jonathan Friedman, and I direct the Campus Free Speech Project at PEN America, where for the past few years, we have been advising and working with colleges and universities around the country on how they can support and uphold their simultaneous commitments to free speech and diversity and inclusion. For those new to our audience, PEN America is a membership organization with members from all 50 states, and our mission is to both celebrate literary expression and uphold the civil liberties that make it possible. I also want to note that our charter commits us to standing against the suppression of thought, ideas, and information, both in the U.S. and abroad, as well as commits us to working to dispel all hatreds. These are ideals which are not always easy to hold in tandem, and today's program represents our commitment and our effort to working through these tensions and issues in the support of a more equitable and just society for all. It is no secret that free speech has dominated headlines about higher education in recent years and society at large at the same time. And I have the privilege today of speaking about these issues with five faculty members, students and administrators drawn from universities around the country. I am very pleased to be joined by Dinam Mangestu, award-winning author, professor of written arts at Bard College and PEN America trustee. Nejma Celestine Donner, director of bias incident support services at the University of Maryland. Jael Karandi, a rising senior at the University of Minnesota and uh, the currently outgoing student body president, as well as Dr. Sharday Davis and Joy Melody Woods, co-founders co of the hashtag turned movement Black in the Ivory. Sharday is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Connecticut and Joy is a doctoral student studying interpersonal communication at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you all for being here. Finally, a note before we begin on format. This is an online forum, and we encourage all watching to submit any questions you have for us to take up in the panel uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. We will begin with an opening round of questions uh, for each of the panelists before moving into open conversation, and we will intend to take up questions from the audience in the second half of the program. I will stress at the outset that it is a forum, and it's meant to be a place for open exchange, a free exchange of ideas. And so if any of you uh, here's something that you want to react to or respond to. Please jump into the conversation. This is a, an opportunity uh, for, for discourse with one another. Um, so without further ado, we will jump in. I'm going to begin with Joy and Charday because I think the past few weeks have seen um, just what, uh, what social media can do, the kinds of um, lights that it can shine on different issues. So your hashtag has unleashed, honestly, a floodgate of information. And I think uh, even you were, I think, a little bit surprised by what has come out. But I want to ask you first, Charday. You know, can you talk us a little bit about talk us through some of the stories that you're hearing? And you know, was it surprising? Was it not surprising? Was it what you expected? Definitely. Um, the stories really run the gamut uh, from physical assault um, against um, black graduate students, for example, um, invading their their space, touching their hair without permission. Um, from racial microaggressions, which unfortunately um, are very covert in nature. So it's really difficult to be able to, to tell, for you to be able to identify it and then to be able to articulate to an aggressor or a white aggressor um, that what they're doing and saying is problematic. Um, so definitely have seen um, these stories, again, just, uh, just be situated across the spectrum. And in terms of being surprised, I'm no, I'm not surprised because to be honest with you and, and just like many of our Black and the Ivory truth tellers, I see myself in almost every story. Um, some of which I have suppressed so deep down that I even forget that I experienced it. So no, sadly it doesn't surprise me. And Joy, I mean, you are a co-founder of this. Um, uh, I think we've seen the stories of how you both were, were texting one another and you decided to put it out there in the world and see what would happen. Um, you know, you're a student, you're a prospective faculty member, and you've been at multiple institutions. All of those institutions, I think, I expect, have straight statements about diversity, about inclusion, about equity for all. And yet, I think what, this, what these stories, I think, and your own experiences have shone a light on is just how commonly 
those statements aren't really backed up by action, that those statements don't really, um, um, and they aren't really uh, uh, stuck to and upheld properly. So my question for you is that, you know, have your own experiences consistently kind of not, uh, your own experiences of higher education, have they not really lived up to that expectation of a diverse, equitable, inclusive community? Um, unfortunately, no. Like, the, I think the, um, the equitable and um, inclusive things that I've had have been the um, anomaly. But I don't really think it like went against my expectations. Um, because like you said, I've been to multiple institutions and I'm, I'm not walking through the world with um, rose colored glasses. So I kind of come into places with the thought process of this this is possible um it could happen it's happened before so i don't think it um i think it met my expectations and they didn't they didn't exceed they didn't let down or they didn't um blow me away in the opposite direction so absolutely not unfortunately and and dina you've been an author and a professor as well at many places um you know this kind of floodgate of stories of racism in higher education on some level, perhaps they're surprising in to the extent that many kind of conceive of higher education as a place that is apart from society, a place for thought, a place for progress, a place for openness, a place where for equity, where all have an opportunity to, to get an education and move ahead in life. So I guess I'm curious, you know, are all of these stories coming out surprising to you? Um, do you think that universities and schools in general have gotten any better at fighting racism since you were a child? You're still on uh, mute. You know, I would say that the idea that institutions are these uh, sort of seemingly idyllic bastions of, of liberal good values is, is never an idea that I think a lot of people have been sort of skeptical of. If you were ever a minority um, college student, I don't think you ever forget those experiences and you don't go into being a faculty member somehow convinced that the world has grown significantly better or has changed. Um, so I've never sort of had that delusional idea that somehow entering academia was going to sort of wash away any racial problems. Um, what is interesting, though, of course, is the way that um, academic institutions obviously value and believe in themselves as being these forces for good, as being oftentimes on the forefront of social change. And that idea that that's who they are and what they are makes it sometimes that much harder for them to realize just how far they fall short of actually living up to those ideals. So when you're actually in the middle and you're inside of those institutions to be able to sort of say, I know you may believe you are as good as you think you are, but in fact, there is this sort of yawning and sort of extremely wide gap between those ideas and what's actually practiced and lived through, not only by the part of the faculty, right? But I mean, I would bring it down to the level, of course, of the students, but also of the people who work inside of these institutions. It's not just, at, you know, professors and students, it's all of the people who go into the maintenance and running of these institutions who oftentimes feel those same institutional forces and pressures working against them. I think as a faculty member or as a student, oftentimes we believe that we have a slightly more privileged position, but in fact, oftentimes we realize that our position is almost just as precarious, that we have a certain sort of role to play within the university, but by no means do we feel like we actually control or can move those institutions as far as we want them to. So I'm going to come back to all of these uh, points later in the conversation. Um, but just to bring in everyone at the outset, Neshma, turning to you next, um, you've worked extensively at universities and at Maryland on responding to hate and racism and bias. Uh, I always think of people that I know on the front lines of fighting these things, and, and, and you're one of the people I have the privilege of knowing who informs how I think about them so much. Um, but one of the biggest issues that it seems once again, you know, we're having conversation after conversation about it, are the ways in which, you know, speech and hateful speech has uh, significant harms uh, that overtly racist and hateful acts um, really do disrupt and destabilize black students' lives. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own views of that and how you've tried to address it as one of the offices in a university that tries to do this kind of every day. Yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> you know, my literal job is to <laughs> respond to hate bias incidents on campus. And so I, I see all of it and all of the things that um, some of our panelists were talking about. I think what I see 
what a lot of people probably don't always get is the impact and the significant harm that it causes to our students of color and our marginalized folks. Um, and so part of what we're doing at the University of Maryland is we, we literally formed a unit specifically <laughs> to address the harm and impact that free speech and, and hate bias incidents can have on folks that are marginalized. Um, and, and what we see is even in those instances where something may happen to the person who has done the particular action or done the particular harm, there is lifelong harm <laughs> that, that sits and continues with the folks who've been impacted. Harm from slurs, harm um, from all of these microaggressions. And, and what we're doing is trying to support and help folks kind of put their lives uh, back together. I think that's a piece that people don't see um, even when they leave the institution. You know, we're still getting emails and people reaching out to us that something in the real world triggered them because of something that happened while they were on our campus. And so I think one of the things that we continue to try to um, preach and emphasize is oftentimes the legality of an action has nothing to do with the impact or the harm, right? It could be very legal and it, yes, it could be free speech. Like, I'm not going to argue <laughs> with that, but there is harm um, and, and we've seen it. And so, you know, part of my job as a clinician and a therapist is to, is to help sort of mitigate some of that and help our students engage in some self-care and communicate and find a way to continue to function. Thanks. Um, I think it's really interesting to connect some of these points as well. You know, the long-term harm, uh, Sharday, what you were saying a minute ago about kind of long-term internalized incidents that you don't even remember. There's, you know, so numerous or they happened so long ago and they were, you know, not anomalous. I think a lot of us think about these things are kind of the anomaly, right? Oh, the racist incident that happened to someone uh, happened, you know, one day out of the year and they went about the rest of their lives living equitably in society and, and a, 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 as though that wasn't an issue, right, day to day. And I think what is so powerful about this moment and other moments, frankly, is the ways in which everyone is being shaken awake to be, no longer be complicit in it. And I think that's very powerful. But I think about, Dina, also what you were saying a minute ago about, you know, this kind of precarious position that people are in. And so the ways in which all of these things kind of connect together. Um, I want to turn to you, Jael, as, as our kind of student, youngest student on the panel, our undergraduate student body president, youngest and yet in some ways equally as catalytic as anyone else. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I saw, I was reading this morning about your profile in Teen Vogue uh, 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 after in the past few weeks. And uh, I know your story and what you were able to do at the University of Minnesota has gotten a lot of attention. I encourage those watching who aren't familiar with it to uh, look it up. Um, but so you were catalytic in, you know, trying to take a stand in, in insisting essentially that the leaders of the University of Minnesota terminate their contractual relationships with the police in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. And I think um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, not just about that letter, but everything that is not known in the kind of public domain. We kind of think of it as, you know, you did this alone and, and you had this effect and it just, you know, the day after George Floyd, um, this was the way in which you, you kind of uh, connected to it and wanted to take action. But I have a, a feeling there was a lot more that went into it. So I was wondering if you could talk about everything that went into your decision and, and, and why you chose to make that uh, letter, uh, write that letter when you did. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. I think what would first to preface in terms of everything, I don't know everything because I think there were so many students before me on this campus who were pushing for either the similar actions or asking for their voices to be heard. Um, I only have my three year tenure in which I can speak to, but I am very confident that there have been students asking for these same actions or asking for that recognition year in, day in and day out, who weren't just undergrads, but graduates and professional students as well. Um, so from what I can say of what I've seen, um, in in my letter, I talk about the Somali Student Association event that happened where we saw a lot of aggressive force from the police, both Minneapolis, um, our university police and other police departments in which that were called in. And I think that was my first experience of seeing this specifically on my campus. Um, 
and not necessarily just in the world or society in which people tend to believe that higher ed, you know, might be siloed from. And so I can say that that was an incident I'd seen, but in terms of everything that had happened, I mean, it's my everyday life, right? It's, it's walking down the street, it's going to the store, it is taking a walk, it is going on a run, it is making sure my brother gets home, it is making sure when my dad leaves at the middle of the night that we're still making sure that he makes it back home. And it is those instances in which that perpetuate this, this idea that we, we can't no longer live in this idea that everything is okay or we're operating in this um, normative that is appropriate for black students or is fair to black students um, and so i think what went into that letter was a lot of history and a lot of seeing these incidents throughout my whole life but also knowing that so many students have been asking for this. this these are conversations i had tried to have numerous times with our administration and asking our police department to recognize what was going on and really take into account the what black students were experiencing on campuses and i think it also got down to the point that at the end of the day we're tuition paying students education is a service we are putting money into these institutions and we deserve that they hold accountable to the values that they're placing on their websites and so in that it was really important to me to sit down with students um, and understand what these are and those conversations had been had but at that point after that murder there was no more conversations to be had there was no more circular committees to be set up there was no more benchmarks to be put in place action needed to be had i, I think it came to a point where i was so frustrated by the fact that we even had to get to a point where it had to be a demand where we had to sit down and say this is what we need because we've been asking and asking and asking and a lot of people have mentioned compromise we've been trying to compromise we've been trying to find a middle ground there is no longer middle ground murder is nonpartisan. murder does not have any there's no discussion to be had about the murder of a black man and i'm no longer willing to have that discussion there is no but Right. And so I think it was very important and the student leaders that work with me on ensuring that letter was set. My executive board voted and unanimously approved the posting of the letter and then later our form in Congress body also approved it. So I went through proper channels of consultation and work by the advisement of my communications director and many others. But at the end of the day, the letter was going to be posted and it had to be said. It's, it's just so powerful, honestly. Um, and I think, I think you speak to such a deep and well understood and well known truth in that both what you're talking about is so deeply serious and we can all, all of us who've had something to do with higher education can recognize the challenges of change, like the challenges of having people listen, the challenges of having students demands or even requests or, or requests for compromise um, uh, heard and acted upon. Um, I think one of the other things that that I was reading in something else in another interview you did where you were talking about you know the reality of what it means that um, uh, a lot of students at the university don't feel safe you know on the campus day to day and I think this has come up on on many campuses and and sometimes it, it there's kind of two dimensions to it one is a question of like physical safety around the police and another one is a question of you know safety from ideas we've seen a lot of conflation of that do you have any reflections or response to it yeah, I, I think in regards to especially physical safety, I think safety is not a fence, right? It's not, um, it's not a gun. It is not your, your presence. Safety has a lot to, more to do with trust. And if you look at the trends and history of our police departments and the American policing system, which is deeply rooted in slavery and what happened in terms of how they have been policing before, that it, it, it's, a, it's systemic, right? So it doesn't matter that you're standing there and telling me I'm supposed to feel safe with you. It has a lot to do with trust. And I can't trust you based on your history. And that's why in my letter, I cited so many incidences from um, the Minneapolis Police Department so people would understand this is not isolated, right? People want to pretend or assume like this is a one-off incident, right? We talk a lot about the idea of bad apples or bad actors. Um, that, that argument does not hold. And then you can talk about bad actors, but then I can tell you about bystanderism. How many cops and police officers have seen this go on and on and on and have not said anything? So I believe that people have to understand that it, it's not this one objective measure. It's not one event in history. It is this trend that has been going on so I can't trust you because your actions and your history tell me otherwise. And I think it's really important that people realize this statement and realize that students do not feel safe. People want to, you know, I, had, I got a lot of questions after my letter. What about the people who don't feel safe? And I said, how many students have never felt safe? How many times have we lost those voices? How many times have we ignored those voices in favor of students who quote unquote feel safety? In terms of the safety of ideas, there's so many people that walk around our campus with racist ideologies and students 
students are forced to sit in those classrooms, listen to those professors, and offer them their respect when, when their very livelihood is constantly being threatened. And so I, I truly believe that it is high time that in administrations and institutions in which students are paying dollars to need to take an account what these students need. It is no longer a pay for them to sit there and not get a return on their investment. I just wanted to see if anybody wanted to react to any of that on the panel. I think one of the things that I think about a lot in terms of safety is emotional safety. Um, and the fact that so many of our marginalized students are not emotionally safe, right? They, they didn't have emotional safety when they got to campus <laughs> uh, because they, they live in the world in a black and brown body. And so getting, um, I, I see a lot of emphasis being placed on physical safety, whereas that's fine. You know, you can, you can have um, guards and security and all of that, but what about the emotional safety of our students, faculty, and staff that day in, day out being exposed to these racist ideas, these microaggressions, um, sometimes just the physical presence of the police. Um, and going back to, again, Im impact, because that, that's what I'm always thinking of, that, that when we talk about safety, we can't just think about it in terms of a physical space. We have to think about what are we doing to ensure the emotional safety of our Black students, faculty, and staff, because um, a lot of it is not there. And that has to do with some of what, Jael, what you were saying around trust, right? In order to have that emotional safety, um, we need trust. We also need resources to be um, caring for the mental health of our Black students, faculty, and staff. So there's so many, there seems to be a large investment in physical safety, but when we come to, when it comes to emotional safety, there needs to be more resources and investment that puts, that is, that gets put in there. Sade, I think, okay, Dina. Oh, no, please, Sade, please go. Okay. Um, I, I was just going to say, I think that, that was absolutely brilliantly stated, Giles, um, that the idea of sort of trust within these institutions and how difficult it is to actually achieve that. And, um, and, and, and I think part of the challenge that sort of comes from that is how do you trust an institution that sort of purports to understand your position and yet at the same time fails to actually demonstrate that understanding? But I think there's also this sort of problem that comes alongside of that, which is, well, how do you actually get the institution to acknowledge that perhaps it's incapable of actually understanding your position because it hasn't actually experienced those aggressions, not only just in the short term, but also over the course of your whole entire life, right? That's the, that's the sort of hard part for me where I wondered, you know, do we actually move? Is there ever a place where we actually we do trust the institutions to fully recognize the gap in our experiences that for a black student or black faculty or black administrator to sort of feel threatened or to feel the sort of challenges that may that they may sort of you know experience daily in the classroom or in the workspace that those experiences are not shared universally across the college and just because you purport to sort of be sympathetic doesn't actually mean that you can fully really participate in that and so how do they acknowledge that gap right how, how do they acknowledge the distance between what they feel like is right and what students feel like they need um, and there's a huge divide there. And, and the way we sort of come through that gap or sort of begin to bridge that is, is a question I, is I don't have an answer to. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear more from Najima about those sensitivity classes and how that actually works. Because it seems like one of the things that, you know, literature and writing and, and, and that has been going on since the history of this country is to try to transmit and sort of, you know, relate that experience. Um, but yet we still confront and sort of see consistently that you can tell people and over the consequences of these aggressions, but that doesn't necessarily mean people actually fully espouse those things, the sort of truths that they can live with. So one of the things I think is that one, there needs to be an understanding of trauma, right? And how that works and operates. But also I think that there's just this, this blatant disregard that black people experience trauma and pain and emotional pain. And so the idea that you can have such a significant emotional traumatic impact from this incident, that does not resonate with people. And that goes back to our history, right? Like the idea that we, 
we are built to tolerate certain things and we, you know, we are built to endure suffering and all of this. And so I think that all of that, that I don't even think that people connect <laughs> the dots that, that we experience some level of emotional pain to the extent that we do. So for me, it begins there that like understanding that this is, this is a thing that that's actually happening. Um, I would say as a fist step, because I see a, a big disconnect when, when I say something like, you know, that person is experiencing trauma. And then it's like, wait, what? <laughs> so that just that, that idea is a surprise to others. I think that before we even get to anywhere, we have to start with acknowledgement. Shade, you were going to come in before. I wanted to give you the chance. Oh, no, actually, I, this is a typical, like, uh, Black women where we give a lot of back channel feedback as a means of demonstrating that I am in full agreement. So that is what you were receiving from me, especially when JL was speaking. I was like, absolutely, 100%. I do want to just speak on the trauma piece, if I can. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that has come up quite a bit um, in our uh, hashtag and in the thread is our Black, uh, black academics, as, as I uh, call them, are communicating trauma traumatic experiences that for some reason when shared in in uh, that kind of isolated moment for example if i were to go to my department chair and to share my story it's as you had mentioned no one considers that to be traumatic no one really gives that the weight that it should be given um, and taken the proper course uh, or recourse in order to address that situation but it's interesting how when all of those stories are aggregated that for, in this, for such a time as this, in this moment in our nation's history, I think finally, maybe, folks are starting to understand trauma. And it is racial trauma. And I will also say that not only is it racial trauma, but I think that in terms of black or white academics, that they are seeing that this trauma was happening at their hands, that they were involved, right, in enacting these behaviors. And so, um, and it's been very interesting to see their response to that. Um, and how they have to sit with that. So you're 100% right. I think it is important in terms of the language as a communication scholar, the language that we use, racial trauma. Do you think, I, I'm just as you talk about, you know, that kind of disconnect between, you know, a black professor goes to their department chair and says, you know, the things that the students are saying to me are racist, or I have been um, hate messaged with 300, you know, horrible emails that, I don't know, bring into question my very livelihood, my very, my very right, right? That that is traumatic for the person and that the university is not set up to respond to that well because you still have to teach a course next week and you're still on a tenure clock. You know, I'm sorry for this experience, but there's a kind of set of structures in place that aren't really flexible around those things. But I'm thinking about the visibility piece of it as well, which is, so like when that's happening to it, when we kind of rewind the clock and we think about, um, how society, you know, visualized discrimination, I don't know, in the 1950s, right? It was very, it was very, it was like very clear, you know, there was discrimination with the, the horrible um, videos and uh, efforts to desegregate schools, you know, it was very visceral, it was very visible. And I, I think a lot of the ways in which racism still exists that is coming out from the hashtag and in other places is more kind of individual, right? So the ways in which, you know, most, you know, black faculty, there are black faculty at the university, we can point to them, there might not be enough, there might not be more than a handful in some departments, but you know, they exist and they occupy a place, no one can say that discrimination exactly is happening in the way it once did. And so the disconnect between I think, you know, what we think of as racism, as we think of it as something in the past versus something that you're saying, or that this hashtag is revealing is actually everywhere, every day, you know, just kind of built into our interactions with each other in other ways. You know, I think that's, I think it's vital. I think, I think, you know, did, did so many people not realize that this was happening? And, and that's, that's what it seems to be this moment is about. Um, I was just going to say, absolutely. I do, I've done work on racial microaggressions and that's exactly it because it's covert, right? It's insidious in nature. And so it's very easy to justify, oh, I didn't mean any harm. You know, you're in a PhD program. So this is, this is what uh, happens, right? In a PhD program, it's difficult for everyone. Uh, or, oh no, I, I wasn't trying to undermine you and your intellect. I just think that you have a lot of room for improvement, right? There's always some retort um, when our story 
stories are told. But the fact of the matter is, is that, and research shows this, is that racial microaggressions have just as much of a negative effect on, uh, on our, our health, not only our mental health, but also our physical health as overt racism. So just because it might be invisible in nature does not mean that it, again, does not have that negative impact. But again, for some reason, that idea doesn't quite penetrate and folks don't quite understand that fully as much as they should. I was going to also, uh, actually Joy, you were gonna say something. Do you wanna go ahead first? Um, I was going to say, and you, what you just brought up, Jonathan, was that um, thinking of the 1950s, and, and for some reason, people have this disconnect of like, that was so long ago, but some of those people who were having that visceral, vile reaction to desegregation are people's parents, or still professors. Um, um, so thinking of like, sure, we aren't blocking black and brown bodies to come into the, to be admitted into the institution, but those people are still in power and have created the systems. So yes, we might be visible as one, but then we need to reframe and ask the question, why is it only one? Or why is it only two? Um, and, and the invisibility is able to happen because how the university and as an institution was built in the first place. Um, because until we look at the foundation of these institutions that initially kept us out, literally kept us out, um, and we had to fight to be here to get an education, until we look at that foundation, then we're going to keep having these conversations. And looking at that, conver and looking at that foundation also includes looking at names of things, um, names of buildings, names of stadiums, names of benches, names of scholarships, name names. Names mean things. And so until we're able to look at that, we're going to continue to round this mountain of how is this invisibility happening? It's very visible, but that's how the system is set up to where it makes it seem like it's invisible. And, and I just want to mention, I think people have thought that the, the blatant segregation has lost its effect or our schools are integrated and now, now we're okay. But in reality, if you look at, you know, back in the 1930s when redlining was birthed, right, by Franklin, uh, President Roosevelt, and you look at what redlining did and how it put students and different families into these different neighborhoods, well, those families stayed in those neighborhoods, they built these communities, but the schools in which were built around those communities were not ready to prepare some of these students for college or weren't given the resources necessary by either the city or the state because it was assumed that these were, you know, they were a threat to society or they would hurt mortgages or they'd hurt the value of the land. So that still perpetuates and those students are now in school. They go to these high schools and these middle schools who are underfunded, under-resourced, we've been defunding education for years, and then they go on to college and they don't feel as career ready and then we start to see them sit back and they still don't have resources and it's cyclical, right? So the, the segregation and all that and the redlining that we still see having effects on our community today is still present. Um, just like you mentioned, like that impact is still very heavy today. And we see how students are coming and we're saying, why aren't you college ready? Well, you defunded every resource that we had in these K through 12 institutions. How were we to prepare our students when we're running low on teachers? We're running low on resources. Students can't come to school fed. So there's so many different things in which people believe it's, it's disappeared and it's um, microaggressions is such an important thing to name, but also the very systemic things that our cities and states and local officials are still doing um, that still perpetuates this forward. And I, that's clearly seen in the housing system. Getting into healthcare, we're seeing with COVID, right? We're pushed into these communities and people are wondering why are we disproportionately affected? Because we're in communities in which we can't supposedly, you know, properly social distance because of redlining and because of where our communities have been pushed to to be able to afford different properties and who affords mortgages and who gives loans. So it really, I, I think we have to also recognize that it's still very inherent in our system. It's still written. You can find deeds that still say white only, that still exist. So I think people have to recognize that it's everywhere and it, and it moves and it pushes unless we find unless we're right now saying we're going to pivot history unless everybody agrees this it cannot just be black people saying this is what we feel and it, we've gone far beyond acknowledgments if you refuse to acknowledge it, you are simply choosing to ignore facts at this point and that's why i'm telling institutions the acknowledgement statements are not your sense of action you saying this exists or you saying you're incapable or you saying you're white and you're empathizing is no longer 
acceptable. We have to move beyond that. Action has to be made and we have to understand where this exists. In regards to microaggressions, even if you go up to department chair, whoever you tell, it falls on deaf ears. There's not an accountability structure that exists where someone's like, I'm going to go back look into this case. I'm gonna make sure this case was resolved. I'm gonna make sure the student knows. I've had cases, I've said things and it's fallen on deaf ears over and over again, which is why students aren't reporting, right? And then we say, well, we think we're doing fine. No, people aren't saying anything because it doesn't matter. Nobody is placing worth. And like you mentioned, that trauma is being really ignored. So we have to realize that overt racism is very present. Um, the microaggressions are very present, but we need to start looking into the systems in which we believe are so well improved and how much progress um, we believe we've made. And, and, and kind of going off of that, thinking of when we look at those policies and when we look at who's affected by those policies, negative, and we're talking about, I'm right there with you, where we're past acknowledgement. Thank you for your black square on social media. Thank you for painting the street. Black lives matter, but I can't even afford to live on that street. So when we think of that, it's time to say, what are you going to change? And when people ask, well, what do you want to see? Radical change. People have been in power for too long. And that's what we have to see, especially in the institutions. What does that look like? What, is the, what do tenure quali qualifications look like? What does an application look like? What does, who is in the admissions office that is passing along um, applications? What is in departments? What is on your syllabus? What is considered actual research project? What is really considered community service? What is, what is, what is? Yes, these campuses are getting food pantries because people can't afford to eat, but why can't we afford to eat? Why can't we afford to live on campus? Why can't we do all these things that other people have to do? And why are we saddled down with so much student loan debt compared to our white counterparts? Those are the conversations that need to start ha happening versus, oh, I read that hashtag and I read your story. Thank you so much for teaching me. Gone are the days are of black folks teaching white people about our trauma for you to learn at our expense. And I think that's where this movement and what you've seen from what people have said on this panel is at. Well, well I think, you know, going back to something you said a minute ago, Joy, about the visibility, the question of it being everywhere in this, you know, you mentioned statues, scholarships, positions, etc. You didn't mention uh, songs, but uh, I know that's also been in the news in Texas, the Eyes of Texas song from a minstrel show, you know, deeply rooted in histories of racism, slavery. And, you know, this is sort of coming back to something we were talking about a minute ago, but like, how can the university committed to so many ideals, right? How could it be a place where, you know, like you said, where, where these kind of vestiges of the past could be deeply visible to everyone if kind of almost it's like if only we opened our eyes. And I think I think of Aunt Jemima, frankly, in the syrup, which uh, has been in the news only really since yesterday and today, I think, but like pretty quick that they decided to like totally upend and throw away that and they're not going to make that syrup anymore. All it took was a whole bunch of people saying this is horribly racist, but I don't understand what's shocking to me. It's like, hadn't anybody, hadn't we all been seeing that all along? Wasn't that deeply visible? And Pepsi and, and, and that company Quaker, you know, those aren't universities. Those are capitalistic, you know, organizations. They're not committed to these kinds of ideals of equity and inclusion. So what does it mean when even in the kind of ivory towers of, you know, forethought and social progress that these vestiges could be so deeply visible? Um, anybody on, on thoughts on that? I don't know. You just said the word capital. You said capitalism. Um, I think of the names of some of the buildings on campus here and they're named because someone gave money. And if we change that name, are we losing money? And, it, and so we're more, just like why campuses are opening and there is no vaccine for COVID, money, right? So we're looking at people afraid to lose money, which they have already shown us that they care more about money than they do our bodies. That was seen with the Ohio State football players today signing, uh, they're accepting any risk of getting COVID so they can play. I don't know those players, but I'm like, that's a real, that's really scary that we're asking people to even sign something like that. And it all goes down to money. And until we have an ethical and moral repositioning, which goes to getting people out of power, we will still be looking at these things that are so visible. Um, and it also goes to what is taught, going back to Dial's comment, what is taught in K through 12? 
Black history is condensed to a month, really to three people, and people think that the bus boycott lasted two days when it lasted a year and a half. So we're still seeing people in the streets right now, and we have Americans like, oh my gosh, you're still protesting. That's our ancestry. That's what we do. We come together and we will stand up until we get what we want and what we need and deserve. And so I think it, it's so many layers and so many, we can't just change the ivory tower and we can't just change K through 12. We have to change it in one fell swoop because one thing will happen and it'll still, it just won't balance itself out. And so this change is literally nation and worldwide. And, and in regards to, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I think one of the things that I have been feeling in terms of all of these folks that are putting out statements and taking off products and changing, like, it feels really performative to me, right? Like, I don't know that people still actually care about our lives and our bodies, right? To go back to Joy, you were talking about capitalism, right? So, so Jonathan, you're asking, like, did they not know? Yes. <laughs> like we, the, we've been having these conversations about all these things that are problematic for years and months. And so for people to be doing it in this time and this moment, like, like great. But the fact that, that you're doing it now in this time and space where all eyes are on you also makes me think it's really performative and you're not really doing it because you care or we're asking, because we have been asking about this for years. And so I, I wonder what, what it's going to look like moving forward when the eyes are no longer on you. Mm. Um, what's going to happen then? It absolutely yeah. is performative because in this day and age, no one wants to, especially in the era of cancel culture, nobody wants to be deemed as the racist. Nobody wants to go and to lose dollars or endorsements or sponsors um, by having, uh, you know, uh, 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 thinking about like iconic uh, symbols, right? Like racist symbols that are attached to, uh, to their company. No president wants their university to be in the national news um, because they didn't go and make a statement. They didn't acknowledge anti-blackness rhetoric or they didn't acknowledge some uh, racist event that happened on campus. And it, so it is, it is performative. And it's interesting how now when you are somehow uh, deemed to, or you are spewing racist rhetoric and it is um, archived in your social media posts or in a video um, that there has been in terms of what Joy is talking about, you have lost dollars. Um, and so I think that it, it, the performance is because people want to make sure that they keep their, that their pockets are, are lined, right? That they can still move forward um, in whatever business that they have. Um, so I think, you're, um, I think you're, you're definitely spot on. And there's been so many people talking about, you know, when these 15 minutes are up, when, especially in November, thinking about how we have an election where certainly race and racism is going to be at the tip of our tongues, but these protests may not necessarily be at the forefront. What is going to happen then? What's going to happen when the light shines off of us, or in, in this case, the university and the ivory towers? That's when the proof is really in the pudding, right? Um, I also wanted to just speak on this idea of we have two different, um, or not two different, but we have individuals who have racist ideologies that are sitting at their conscious and subconscious levels, but then you also have racism that's riddled with it, that's institutionalized, right? And so speaking about to what um, JL has been saying about how it's systemic and all of these different um, uh, systems, all of these different um, you know, thinking about history, it all intersects, it all creates a really complicated context for which we are here today, for which I might have my boss, uh, when I'm sharing my an incidence of racism or something that my student has said, it falls upon deaf ears. That's not just one isolated incident. There are years and years and years, historical events that go and bring us to that moment. So not only do we, are we talking about individuals and how we need to go and, um, uh, for example, white folks, white academics, how they have room uh, for improvement, how they need to go and interrogate and have introspective conversations with their own selves about the biases that sit uh, uh, beneath. But also we need to talk about actual, as Joy was saying, this in radical institutional change. And again, not just the academy, um, but in various institutions across the United States. I just wanted to uh, make that point um, uh, beforehand. But yes, performative, I agree.
So I want to switch here for a second just to t come back to the other key theme here in our in our panel, which was the issue of free speech as a concept and how it's been upheld or not. I think, you know, many of the stories that we're talking about here are stories inevitably where speech is at play, where people are trying to use their speech to call for change, to um, um, mobilize. Uh, and it's interesting to think about, you know, in the U.S. we have the First Amendment, but even around the world there are uh, uh, free speech is, is codified in international human rights law, including in both the UN Declaration of, the, of Human Rights and um, the International Convention on Eliminating Racial Discrimination. So my question for you is, as you think about this as Black members of academic communities on campuses, you know, do you feel like free speech as a concept has been something that has been an ally to this cause, it has been properly and equitably upheld. Um, Nejma, you were talking a little bit about, a minute ago about like the challenges of free speech, but are there kind of advantages or, or, or pros to it as well? So I'll answer the first question and then I'll... Um, you cannot have a discussion about free speech without having a discussion about power right? Because the ways in which free speech operates on campus is that those that hold power have more access to free speech. They have more resources to engage in free speech. And the battle of free speech really is a battle over power. Um, I think that many times, while free speech can be an ally for those who are marginalized, when marginalized folks engage in counter speech, so to, so to speak, they're looked as though they are contesting free speech or that what they're doing is not actually exercising their own free speech. <laughs> that in, in some ways they are trying to um, attack free speech when really they're just engaging in their own free speech. So I think that the ways in which we see free speech is deeply rooted in anti-blackness and white supremacy. Because if it, if it wasn't, when it could be an ally. And when marginalized folks use their voices, it would not be seen as an attack on free speech. Rather, it would be seen as you're exercising your own free speech. Even the way in which we say uh, marginalized folks can engage in counter speech. That word counter can be heavy, right? And can also, just the way that they talk about it, can, people can receive it as well. It's, you're attacking free speech because it's, it's, it's counter. Um, and so for me, it can be an ally if we rethink the way that we look at it and we really see it as a way for marginalized folks to have a voice rather than looking at it as when someone is marginalized, who's marginalized, say something, it's an attack on free speech. And in order to do that, we can't, our views of free speech cannot be rooted in white supremacy and anti-blackness, right? So when, when the First Amendment was created, it was not created for people that look like us. <laughs> so let's just be clear about that. Equal, equality was not on the mind. And so we have to figure out how we're going to ensure that we have a voice and, we, and people understand that the free speech is, is just a tool for us as it is for other folks. But I don't think that that's the way that it is seen on campus. At least that has been my experience. Dina, anything to add on the issue of free speech and students on campuses? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would agree strongly with Najima's point that oftentimes when you're being critical of the way free speech is sort of employed or the right for people to speak freely, when you're critical of that, of those rights, or when you say that someone's using speech in order to attack or threaten or to sort of minimize um, somebody's existence, to acknowledge that isn't because you're trying to necessarily sort of take away from free speech, but you're acknowledging this inherent sort of power difference, right? That we don't all come to speech with the same level playing field. And that in fact, the easiest way to sort of ensure that there's more equity in speech or that there is something that resembles equal free speech across the campus is to ensure that, is to ensure that there's an actual equality on the campus, right? Not just in terms of representation of minorities and black bodies, but also a representation, an equal representation of values, that the values of black academics, black students, 
that those ideas, that those experiences are valued to the same degree. If we get to that point, then we can, I think, begin to sort of argue more about what free speech might sort of actually look like. But that means also, you know, I think you have to really, it goes back to this important idea of, of trust that Jael noted, right? Like I want to trust my sort of colleagues in the institution that I'm in, um, but in order for that trust to happen, I need to sort of actually believe that there is an equal amount of value is placed on my ideas and on my beliefs. Um, doesn't necessarily mean I think we need to start figuring out how to sort of curtail speech, but I think it does mean we need to think about the way that speech is inherently a source of power and that we don't all approach it or have that equal access to it. And we've seen in Texas, the protests this week, demands from the, um, a number of athletes, including football players, and Jael, I know you also have worked in athletic relations in Minnesota. And I think, you know, across the board, the way that the tilting of university in, in recruitment works is that there are many black students who are very active in athletics. And I think what's surprising perhaps is that in 2020, those are the students demanding that we get rid of, I don't know, old minstrel songs um, or, or demanding that a, a, in Texas that, they, um, that the university adopt a module on the history of racism for students. I mean, you know, is, do you, do, when you think about like free speech and black athletes for, for you both, I'm just curious, you know, do you think that's a, a place or a group of people who have felt like free speech is for them? Quite frankly, no, not at all. Um, and, it, it, and it is, um, because I'm not an athlete, I want to be careful of how I speak on this experience um, or have not been there. But from what I can see, um, our athletic programs and the way they function and the way it goes function is you're very used to somebody telling you exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, right? So they're not, not necessarily be a clause that suppresses this is exactly what you should say, or this is exactly what you can't say, but there is a very underlying norm that should you decide to speak, this would be a repercussion. Or a very, um, you know, athletics talks a lot about culture, right? Um, our culture here is to do this, and this is what our culture looks like. So all of us should be adhering to this culture, right? We, we don't do this here, so like don't ever go against the culture in doing so. Thankfully, um, I've seen our athletic programs here at the University of Minnesota be very strong in encouraging athletes to speak out during this time against the injustices. I've seen many athletes at protests. I've seen them proudly wearing the athletic gear, which I'm very happy to see. But again, it goes beyond that. that further puts the burden on the students to have to be able to show this, right? It has to go beyond that, it has to look at recruitment. And now we're even seeing some high school athletes who are very high star recruits are saying they wanna to go to historically black universities, right? And colleges, what is that telling you? What does that speak to our predominantly white institutions? And how important it is to recognize why they are making that shift and why we're looking to invest back into our black community. We've been continuously putting our dollars into these institutions that don't value our lives. So students are saying, I'm going to take my time talents elsewhere. I'm going to go somewhere where I believe my life is valued so that I'm not looking to just be monetized off of, right? And I'm not saying all sports are monetized. We know that there's very few sports that actually bring in profitable revenue streams, but these athletes are still coming here and they're extremely talented athletes, but might not necessarily see where they fit in terms of the respect in, in regards to their race. And so I think it's very important that institutions take that into note. I'm very proud of the athletes at UT Austin for doing that um, and taking that stance. It, it means it's really Really hard to take that stance. It's really hard to write that letter because you're putting in jeopardy your scholarship, right? We don't talk about the fact that these students are putting their scholarship dollars on the line or the benefits that they've received on the line to be able to do this. And that speaks volumes. And to your comment on, on Jemima, I want to just note when Colin Kaepernick, right, was peacefully kneeling five years ago or so, whatever it was, everyone kept, was harping on him and harping on him. And the only company that really looked to come to his defense was Nike, right? We saw Nike do their campaign, a couple of others that did something. But we really saw the big, the biggest company that I saw at least come to his campaign was Nike. Now we're seeing the very same NFL, right, that was really coming hard on him, the very same quarterbacks, the very same teammates are now coming to say, like, we value black lives and to this. And now they're saying, well, now we have rioters and looters, please be peaceful. But when he was peaceful, it was also an issue, right? So I just want to note that there, be, there comes this, um, we talked about being performative, but it's, it's to monetize off of this, right? You don't want to lose your black dollars. You don't want to lose your black votes. You don't want to lose, like, the millions and billions of dollars in the black community. You don't want to lose that, right? You don't want to be the company that do that. Even barring being labeled as that, you can't afford during a pandemic to also lose that money. So I think we have to be careful. And I've said, I said this, um, 
many times. I'm, I want to see your financial statements in FY21. I want to see that you didn't just shift your diversity and inclusion budget, but you went over and above it. I want to see that you actually donated to these organizations. I, I want to actually see that anybody can write a statement, right? I can pledge $50 billion, but are you actually going to do it? And are you going to do it no matter what your financial circumstances or wherever your company is? In six months, if your company is near bankruptcy, is that money going to, are we going to shift that money from that budget and move it again, right? So I think, um, I, I know I kind of shifted from the schools, but I think we have to really see where athletes have come in terms of Colin Kaepernick and what he tried to do peacefully and what he tried to do years ago. And, and society at large ignored him and hated him and kept making this, this battle and this argument in regards to the flag and respect. And it, it wasn't about that. It was about the police brutality and the murder of black men and women that was happening over and over again. Yeah. Um, so I'm, um, I'm very proud of the UT players. I don't know any personally, but um, I'm tied to two teams right now who are doing amazing things, um, University of Iowa as well. Um, and they just took social media by storm and started dropping stories by what has been going on. And I think someone here touched on there's no, when it falls on deaf ears and there's no mandatory reporting, um, I think that's what we're really seeing, and that will be what could change for athletics, really across the campus, but really for athletics, because there have been people possibly these players have confided in, but unlike when you're assaulted, there's no ways to go. There, it's, I, I could be told a story, and what do I, who do I tell? Like, who do I flag down to say, hey, a student just told me about a racist incident? And what do they do? So it's this thing of that there's no system in place. Um, and they are putting so much on the line. I made the mistake of reading comments. I don't know why. Um, but I'm reading these comments and seeing what some of some fans are saying about some of these people are just boys. They're still, they have teen in their age. They're, they're, they're younger than their sons. They could be their sons. And the things that they're saying, and it's like, there's no way that you are unable to see unless you are blind and you don't want to see the connections and the, the trajectory of how some athletic systems, especially D1, Power 5, um, recruitment of Black bodies brings in money, how that isn't a parallel to slavery. Because they're still muted. Some schools have just now lifted their social media ban so their student athletes can now tweet. Why else, why would you block your students from using social media when they're the same age as their peers and that's what people do? Why would that be a thing that they can't do unless you know they're going to say something or they're not allowed to say something? And of course, we're not going to speak up because it goes to Giles' point of that's the culture. And so we often see what we're seeing now is across the board, black and brown bodies are fed up. And they're tired and they're like, wait a minute, I'm putting my legit life on the line. I'm signing something that says, I don't care if I get COVID. I don't care if I break something and lose my scholarship. So they're like, if I'm gonna put my life on the line, how come I can't speak up about the other people's lives? Um, and, I, and I'm really, I'm, cause I know some players different, at different institutions personally, and I'm just very proud and, you know, hoping like, just like they've reached out to us to see how people can support us. I want people to reach out to if they know people who do play these sports and are speaking out and are out at protests and have been captured on camera or whatever, reach out to them and make sure they're okay. Because they, they carry a bigger weight than us regular schmegular students at institutions, unfortunately. You, know, you, raise, oh, you raise the, the, the questions of um, repercussions, right, for speaking out. And I think one of the other interesting things I saw this week um, by someone who was using the Black and the Ivory hashtag was about how they said that the stories that had come out online so far aren't even the worst of it. You know, that basically like the, there's like this kind of category of the really horrendous things that people have experienced, which they aren't even really ready to share. Uh, at all in public. And I guess, you know, we're identifying here some areas where, you know, free speech appears not to be equitably upheld and not equitably um, championed for all. And so I'm just wondering, you know, Chardé, as you're thinking about repercussions of having started this as an assistant professor on the tenure track, you know, are, is there concerns about retaliation? Is there not a sense that, you know, your, I don't know, academic freedom, your rights to free speech wouldn't be upheld the same ways that they would be and have been on numerous campuses 
for academics who have touted pseudo racist or blatantly racist comments? Um, absolutely, because um, that's, it's funny that we talk about free speech and this being the first amendment because nothing in the constitution, that's not the, the human equalizer. It's not the gold standard. We have to think about who created them, right? old, white, cisgendered, heterosexual, very, very wealthy men. So um, anything, you know, think about de jure versus de facto, though I may have the right to do something, in reality, um, no one is going to afford me that right. So 100%, even though I know I have every right to speak on my own stories, my own experiences, um, the fact of the matter is, is others don't see, don't recognize that I have that right and are going to um, perhaps uh, pursue action uh, accordingly. Um, I am, that's definitely something I take into consideration as anyone would. Um, you know, there is a, a going, you know, saying that when you are junior faculty and you're on the tenure track, um, you, you put a muzzle over your mouth. You just put your head down and you do the work so that you can get tenure. Um, and at the end of the day, you, everyone has to make their own decision. And for me, I choose to stand on the side of right. Um, and if that means that that costs me, honestly, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Because truth be told, women of color also disproportionately get denied tenure even though they deserve it. So I have to do what I can. Um, I'm really fortunate, thank thankfully, that I've actually received nothing but support from various members of, of my uh, university leadership and administration, including the university president. Um, and so I'm, I'm thankful for that. And, you know, we'll just continue to be in conversations to work together to see um, what this looks like. I'll also say too that um, there's the black tax. I have half the resources, but I'm expected to do twice the work. And so because of that black tax and something that I've realized since I started in academia or in uh, yeah, doing research since my undergraduate career, I have had to work uh, very hard. So I also can stand on my record and my record is solid. So if anyone tried to come back, try to come at me because of something that I said and I've stood on the side of right, um, it, it, would be, it would be telling where that came from because it's not because I didn't deserve tenure. Well, and this has come up, and I want to turn now to some of the questions in the Q&A as well, just to integrate them into our conversation. You know, this has come up, the question of Black faculty being asked to serve on diversity committees. And, and I want to say kind of like the diversity committee of the week almost is the, is the, is the sentiment, certainly, that I have been, that has been shared with me, um, that a lot of that work goes, you know, either unpaid or unacknowledged. Um, when you are the black faculty member in a department and the black student or a few of them are having a difficulty, the kind of emotional work that you're called upon to do that's not really reflected in your tenure record or your publications, but you know, takes time, takes emotion, takes, you know, maybe it's trauma inducing for many people involved, and that the systems in the university don't really acknowledge it and aren't really well uh, prepared. So there was a question here in the Q&A, which I'll, I'll give to you first and then anyone else, but you know, what can be done about this? How can, how can such committee work, at least if we were to bound the question to committee work, be made effective so that change does happen? Any thoughts? Absolutely. Um, first, in your merit, most uh, universities have a, a merit system uh, where you have, at least in my department at UConn, you have certain points that equate to dollars and you get certain points for things that you do and service is one of them. And so that definitely needs to be codified in terms of the types of service um, that is being done, particularly the service that um, women of color and people of color shoulder um, disproportionate, uh, disproportionately more than our white colleagues. Um, so in terms of dollars, that's a very easy way for us to kind of codify that. But also in terms of the PTR, promotion to tenure process, that absolutely service um, uh, not only just on committee work, but the other mothering that we do. Um, as, as you had mentioned uh, to our students, um, the mentorship that I do to other junior faculty who are a few years behind me, um, all of that is not only the emotional labor, but also time that's taken away from my research, right? So that also has an impact on how much I can produce and my productivity that absolutely is at the center of that uh, of my you know evaluation um, so those are two very easy ways and in fact those are some suggestions that we are bringing to our president as I will meet with him on Friday um, two of just a few um, that can be done Dina any suggestions for how committees can be more effective at, at making change yeah I mean I, I, a part of me would suggest that you sh you can't just have a, a diversity 
committee, right? Where you sort of segregate that issue and that concern into sort of one particular body and let that body be the sole force that's responsible for interrogating all the various ways in which discrimination or bias or sort of segregation might work across the campus. I think there needs to be a way which those issues and those concerns are kind of actually integrated into every sort of committee across the campus. So you're not just waiting for the diversity committee to raise their hand and say, actually, you know what, that has a disproportionate effect on black students or minority faculty, but to actually have that process and that work be integrated into sort of everything, right? When you have a, a committee on tenure, when you're having a committee on curriculum committees, when you're having a committee on housing, all of those things inside of all of those committees, there should be an active and constant sort of need to reflect on the equity of those positions, on the equity of those committees and the decisions they make. Do they affect all students equally? Probably not. And if so, how do you begin to actually ask those questions? If you're looking to the diversity committee to be the one to raise those problems, you're never going to get through everything, right? You're never going to actually try to address all those things. And you're always going to be able to say, well, we have them over there working on those issues. And that means you're never actually taking the issues seriously and you're never actually understanding them to be an integral part of the way the institution functions. You think of it as something, as an appendage that can sort of be dealt with on the sidelines and that's never going to work. And it's always going to disproportionately fall on black faculty to actually address those concerns rather than making it the problems for everyone. Jael, you've been effective on a committee at a university making change. What do you reflect on that? What can other people learn from you? Uh, one, I think student representation is extremely important. I will always push for that on these committees um, in that sense. But the committees have become somewhat circular in the sense of, you know, you come, you get a charge, we kind of talk about it. Two years later, there might be a report. We might take the recommendations. We might not take the recommendations. And then four years later, the same issue arises and we do the same dance, right? So. I, I personally believe we have to push for something beyond committees and we need to, um, like Dr. was codifying these different things and, you know, it, it should not be a question of will my tenure be threatened should I choose to speak up on these issues, right? How does that violate free speech, right? Like why, why, why aren't we talking about how that comes against your First Amendment? Um, so I think in terms of people being effective on committees, one, these, we, we need to put timelines that are that go against the trend and the precedent in higher ed of two, three, four, five years, right? When I came onto campus and we were demanding for the renaming of our buildings, I was a first year student. I'm going into my final year and we're still having the same conversation when history, artifacts, letters, all this has been brought forth. And then I'm, I'm, quite, I'm, I'm brought to believe that we're just choosing to ignore it, right? We're choosing to ignore facts. Um, so I think what needs to happen is that we, we need to stop having more committees and we need to start asking for action. We have to start asking asking for action. Committees are a smoke screen, and to some extent, they can feel very gaslighting to students. It makes it seem like, oh, I'll just throw this into a committee somewhere. And these issues, like I've just been mentioned, we need to have a diversity program in every sector. We need to have somebody in enrollment talking about diversity. We need to have somebody in housing talking about diversity. We need to have somebody who's sitting in academic success talking about diversity. It should not just be, let's go to the diversity committee and ask them about our academic success plan. It should be somebody creating that academic success plan is looking into diversity. And it also, even beyond that, as universities start to evolve, needs to be less of the ask of one person and rather the ask of everyone, right? I can't just, everybody needs to have a diversity diversity mindset. Everybody needs to look into how they can include students, and that goes beyond just the racial bias training you do at the beginning of the year, right? We need to start ensuring that the people that we're putting at our institutions that are looking to serve students, right, that's what we should all be there for, are actually looking at every student, not just what their majority looks like. Thank you, and thank all of you. Um, We've had a question, a few questions here in the in the Q and A about hate and hate speech. And Nishma, I know this is something where you've done a lot of work, particularly around the question of when so much of hateful expression, denigrating expression, is protected speech by the First Amendment, or uh, particularly at a public university. You know, how can universities confront that in ways that don't infringe on you know quote unquote people's rights to free speech, um, and in ways that you know, can acknowledge the harm that speech has done to students. And in other cases, I mean, could you talk us a little bit about how you've thought about some of those challenges and what you've done? Yeah, sure. sure. So I think for me, when I think about the role of a university, as it relates to speech, free speech, it's not really a place where every idea needs to be treated equally or every idea needs to have the same value, right? Like you, 
you can you can acknowledge that someone has the right to free speech but also engage in moral leadership and denounce the content and I, what i see happening so many times is that there seems to be this fear that if i if i speak out against this hateful action then i'm speaking out against this person's right to free speech and I actually think that that is sort of cowardly in some sense. Like I want leaders of our institution to engage in moral leadership and to stop acting as though there are two sides, right? Because there are some, there's, when we give voice to, let's, let's consider both sides, then what we're actually saying is that in some ways, these ideas can be equal on their merits. <laughs> and what we know, and Jael, you talked about, there, there's no two sides when it comes to murder. There's no two sides when it comes to anti-Black racism, right? And so to, to, to offer the idea that, let's hear this other side out, oh, I think what we're, what we're saying is that there's, there's some equality on the merits of what people are saying. But we, university's leaders what i think needs to happen is to say that's fine you know you have a right to free speech and i can also take a stance against the contents of what you're saying as opposed to the right i think another thing is that what i would like to see in university space is that we i know we're talking about free speech here but we need to stop acting like that's the only amendment Right, like we have the Fourteen Amendment, which speaks to equality, and 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 oftentimes the First Amendment, which free speech tends to trump that. Where did that come from? Right, we have to also be thinking about all the other uh, amendments and laws that offers marginalized folks the right um, and space to do things. So for me, it's what I do is engage in some moral leadership. I don't even. When people come to me with free speech, I don't even go down that, that, that road with them. Because for me, it's about, that's fine. I am denouncing your content and I'm also focusing on the impact of your actions. And so I think people put free speech in front of us as a way to gaslight us or a way to distract us from what is really happening. And so as much as possible, I don't even engage in that conversation. I'm like, okay, yeah, fine, sure. Free speech and let's talk about these other things that are happening. Because if we, if we go down that road, I think it's a place where it can be very hard to, to pull, pull back from. And oftentimes what it does is that it's censor the people who are causing the harm. It's not censoring marginalized folks. It's not censoring black folks. Um, and we really have to get away from that. So for me, that's what I do. And that's what I would like to see more of across universities. Any other thoughts from anyone on the issue of confronting hate speech and protecting free speech at the same time? Yeah, you know, I, I was, I, I would agree with everything that Jima said. And, and I would also just, you know, one of the, I think, challenges for sort of how we actually respond, especially to hateful speech, is that it will, it will constantly evolve, you know, and that's one of the sort of challenges and, and the sort of trickiness about it, you know, hateful speech will sometimes announce itself very clearly, but more often than not, it will do it in the most subtle and quiet ways. Um, and oftentimes the only people who might feel like they actually recognize it are the people most deeply affected by it. Um, and so I think the question isn't necessarily like, not to sort of restrict speech, but how do you make sure the people who are actually affected by it actually can sort of acknowledge it and address it and speak to it in a way that doesn't actually leave them silence, in a way that doesn't actually accuse them of trying to, to, to diminish or take away anybody's right, but to say, actually, I recognize this speech for what it is, even though it might not come out in the most overt and obvious ways that it used to, and that my recognition of that and my declaration of that and my anger at that should be acknowledged not as a threat to speech, but as a rightful and sort of righteous response to the threats that that type of language sort of poses. It might not necessarily declare itself to be threatening, but I understand it to be. 
Um, and I'm exercising my same right and also being able to sort of point that out. And that's the type of speech I think we need to sort of argue as the thing we're also preserving. Oftentimes the argument seems to sort of be that we're preserving the right of somebody to say something hateful. And that right, I think, is already sort of well entrenched. You know, um, I think Najima noted, it's there. Um, it's not going to sort of be stripped away. No one necessarily knows that we can't strip it away because it'll just change. It'll go from wearing a Klan hat to wearing a Bermuda t-shirt and it'll just alter itself into some other form. But how can we make sure we're always able to acknowledge it and state it, and state it in a way that doesn't actually jeopardize our positions, to state it in a way that doesn't feel like, oh, that's somebody complaining or trying to restrict speech, when in fact, it's somebody actually acknowledging hate where hate exists. I think, I'm not, if I can just also just add, I think what I also see when it comes to hate speech is that folks will say, well, you know, it's, it's just words, <laughs> it's just speech. And I think what is really important moving forward is that there are some who want to separate speech from conduct, but we know that words matter. And we know that language has been weaponized to perpetuate violence against black and brown bodies. We know that racist speech constructs this reality that constrains our freedom of black and brown folks because of their race. And so in many ways, we need to push back on that notion that speech and conduct cannot always be separated, right? That you will say this thing and you will cause harm. You will kill me. Like, I cannot just say that that's speech and it's like contained in this space. And so the more that we can continue to, to push back on those who want to try to separate the two, and in some instances that might be okay, but more so, more so, we have to be able to say that, that when you say that, I am going to believe, based on the continued violence against Black bodies, that you're going to do that. And so I'm going to take that as something that I cannot separate. So that's another thing as we're, we're moving forward that, that we should all be thinking about. Well, and as we move forward, um, this has been such a great conversation, really enlightening on many fronts, and we're just about out of time, but I want to ask one quick lightning question. So you're only allowed one answer, and it has to be fast, but we're going to go around really quick. I want you to just imagine really quickly, you're a university president, congratulations, uh, uh, and you can do something tomorrow in reaction to the events of the past month, in reaction to our conversation today. What is the one thing that elevates to the top of your list? that is most important that you would do if you could tomorrow. You could do anything. This is a, a, a radical imagination, radical change. So um, I'm gonna start with Joy. You're in my upper left, so. That's so rude. No, um, quick, I would say fund black, give black students and faculty back pay in a raise. Thank you, Jal. Gosh, this is so hard. Um, I would honor all the demands that any black student had or brought to me. Neshma. Yeah, same. I would pay black folks for, the, all, for their labor. <laughs> Sade. That's it. For the, for the demands, the reports that have been brought to my attention, I would actually carry them out and then pay for that labor accordingly. And final comment, Dina. Tomorrow, what are you going to do? I would make it free. And I would unrestrict the endowments. In order to support it, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Um, just want to thank everyone in the audience for tuning in today. Thank all of our panelists for, for such a rich and enlightening and necessary conversation. I feel like I've learned so much just listening to all of you from different you know, areas of expertise and experience on these topics. And um, for those in the audience who, who haven't had the chance to look at it, I think I just want to end with saying we have tried in our uh, PEN America's Campus Free Speech Guide online to try and um, speak to this precise issues uh, on the issues of hate speech and free speech. So please do check it out. It's at campusfreespeechguide.pen.org. And uh, if you don't follow our social channels, please stay tuned for uh, more upcoming activities uh, later this month and over the summer. Thank you all so very much again. Thank you, Jonathan. God bless y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Great to meet you.